Um, reminder that next week, hold on one second. I'm noticing that my link, by the way, is kind of lagging. So I hope nothing goes wrong. Um, but but next week um, will be a, a terrific, messy conversations. The Anti-Racism Task Force will be joining us um, and we'll be in conversation with them about um, the work they're they're doing, what they've accomplished, what they uh, are, are hoping to do, what challenges they're meeting with all the stuff going on with the union and the affiliation and everything else. Um, so it should be a, a very lively uh, conversation. Gives us a, a chance to keep uh, the racial uh, issues and, and anti-racist uh, uh, agenda alive and um, in, in, in our purview. So that should be a great conversation. Um, you may not know that um, uh, in Los Angeles, a community partner for a good many years, Essawan Books, uh, has closed. Um, Essawan was actually, uh, for a year or so, was, was our bookstore way back in the day. Uh, and then we've been um, giving panelists, messy conversationalists, gift certificates to Essawan for participating uh, on our panels. So it's a it's a loss for us specifically uh, for messy conversations, um, and then also for, for Antioch. But new things are in the works, and we'll keep you posted on on that. Um, and as always. Uh, Keep yourself muted until you step into the conversation, and we encourage you to use your chat function to put down any ideas, questions, concerns, uh, you know, uh, anything that begins with the cuss sound, I guess, can go into the chat. Um, and then um, that will enrich our conversation, so you don't just have to listen to your conversationalist. Um, but we can all participate more fully. Today, we'll be talking about uh, Antioch Los Angeles's bridge program. Uh, and we're very, very fortunate to have uh, Catherine Pope and Russell Thornhill, who are the co-directors of the bridge program these days, um, joining me. And I was the, uh, am, was the uh, founding director uh, of the program and designed the program. Um, that we launched back in this time of year, 1999, um, which is really kind of hard to believe. So um, I want to let uh, Catherine and Russell just say hello, and then we'll 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 start our our conversation. Hello, everyone. It's good to see you all. It's good to be here um, on on our little boxes, um, but it's just good to see everybody. Um, I've been a part of the bridge program since David Tripp told me about it when I was working on my bachelor's degree in 2010. And he said, I think I got something that you might be interested in. And I've been in love with the program ever since. So it's good to be here to share with you where we are, where we're going and so on. Hello, I'm Catherine. I've been, uh, I also heard about Bridge through David Tripp, uh, surprisingly. Um, in 2006, I started working with Bridge and I also uh, teach uh, writing classes in Bridge. Thank you, Russ and, and, and Catherine. So we've we've got four, four questions that we figured we would like to um, be in conversation around. And the, the first one is, you know, how, how would you describe what Bridge is? Uh, and what it is that that makes Bridge unique from your perspective. I, I think Bridge is such an, um, uh, an, an exceptional learning opportunity and engagement opportunity for people who have uh, been away from the classroom, have had life challenges, whatever those issues are that kept people out of the classroom, Bridge is such a unique experience to invite people into a safe space um, to be able to re-engage uh, learning 
And we learn it together. We learn it as a community, the community of learners, a concept that we have at Antioch University is huge in bridge. So this really allows people who have not been in this environment before an opportunity to come back. And hopefully it'll, it'll spark something in them to say, I want to continue on, which it generally does. It, it sparks something in people to say, I want to continue on with learning. Um, and uh, just to add, uh, to what Russ just said about uh, community connection, the students are together for nine months. Um, I also want to acknowledge we have many uh, experts on bridge in the room today. So many of you um, may know uh, uh, even more about what makes uh, bridge unique if you've been in the classroom and have experienced what what bridge means to you. Um, so uh, I, that's the end of my answer. <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> Well, let, let, you know, I, I want to uh, answer that question uh, by telling some of the origin story of Bridge, uh, if I could, real quickly. Um, so, you know, Bridge, if you don't know, is a three-quarter long uh, education program uh, that's offered completely free of charge for the poor and working poor of Los Angeles. Um, and uh, the, the program focuses on the humanities and the writing arts. So art, history, philosophy, and literature, um, rather than what you often see for that community, which is you know, job preparation kind of uh, a focus. This is, so, so Bridge has always been hard to understand exactly what it is. When we would go after money, people would say, oh, well, is this a commun community program or is this an education program? And it was hard for them to see the two things together. Um, the idea came uh, from a former student of mine, Sherry Foos, uh, back when I was the chair of the undergraduate studies program in Los Angeles. And she came to me and said, hey, I heard about this Clementi program that's run through Bard College, and it sounds like something that would be perfect for Antioch. And um, so over time, we looked into that, and I looked at uh, Bard's uh, curriculum, and I thought, you know, this is not really something we want to do. Um, and so I said no. Uh, to that. And and Mickey, who was in charge of, I can't remember his last name, unfortunately, but he was in charge of the bridge program. He was faculty at Bard. And he said, oh, no, 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 you can change this however you want. And I said, oh, well, in that case, <laughs> here's what we'd like to do. You know, we don't want to focus just on traditional age students. At Antioch, we serve all students, all adult students, regardless of age. And they had a cutoff of like 30 years old. Nobody over 30 could apply. And we also, you know, we don't want to just present the canon when it comes to philosophy and literature and art history and teach the, 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 the Western canon as if that was somehow ameliorative in and of itself. Um, we want to include other voices. We want to include voices of folk who hadn't been included in the canon and voices of folks who critique the canon. And Mickey said, yeah, no, um, you can't really do any of those things. So I asked Sherry Foos, you know, what do you think about going our own, going out on our own and, and, and doing it? And she said, sure. And to her great credit, she single-handedly funded Bridge for those first few years. Um, and, you know, Br Bridge provides, what is it, like nine, nine or 12 units uh, of, of tuition for free, books for free, transportation for free, uh, tutoring for free. And in the early days, we also provided meals for free and uh, child care for free. So what we were trying to do is eliminate all obstacles for that population um, in terms of 
uh, their ability to come to school and, and earn credits. And I think that that's, for me at least, is what makes Bridge really uh, unique. We, we kind of carved our own, own path. I don't know if Russ or Catherine want to add to that at all. I, I did, and e e even being in this um, uh, this environment, we're in the virtual world. We 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 found all the ways we can to ensure that our students still have access. Um, the year that the the year that we shut down, it was the winter. I forgot which one it was, but the winter at the end of that winter quarter, we knew that um, for those students who were with us, that bridge could not end. They 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 poured their themselves into it, and we just needed to find a way. So during that break, going into spring, uh, Catherine and I had workshops with our students, um, helping them to get online, helping them to get on Sakai, everything we needed to do to ensure they continue to have access, even to uh, help provide a laptop if we needed to and so on. Because the most important thing is that Bridge is available, right? Bridge is available. So we, we immediately did the shift and our students were able to come in and continue the year with us. And then going into the next year, we did some shifts as well. So that bridge was still available in the virtual environment. And today we have students from, uh, from around the world, from South Africa, from Jamaica, from around the country. Um, and we work with them during the summer when they decide they wanna come to have access. And, that, and that's, what, that's what's been beautiful about the experiences that we've had. We, we didn't have to limit it just to LA uh, in the virtual environment. We were able to open it up and help people have access to this academic experience. Yeah, thanks Russ. I, I love that word access and in thinking about what that means in the classroom, um, uh, taking away as many barriers as possible. And then the, the community itself provides access to each other, if that makes sense. Um, because uh, it, it's not the kind of environment, I hope it's not the kind of environment where students feel like they have to go it alone and um, uh, kind of pull themselves up by the bootstraps. I hate that saying, um, but instead that that everyone comes together and we help each other out, and we 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 start with where we are, where we all are together. Um, and I I hope that that's something that also makes it more accessible and 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 takes away some of the maybe some of the social barriers or some of the invisible barriers that can be there uh, when going to school. Yeah, thank thank you, Russ and Castle, uh, Catherine. Um, in in the early days, that that spirit of we're in this together was the only thing that kept us going because we were building the program as we were teaching it in that first first year. Um, Blair Smith was the administrative uh, support for that, and she and I would go across the street to this little Mexican restaurant after every bridge class and figure out all right what did we mess up this week and 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 you know what are we doing next week and one of the things that that came out of that was this sense uh as we used to say and as i've heard echoed in the halls of bridge uh throughout these 20 plus years um bring it to bridge bring it to bridge whatever's going on bring it to bridge and we'll figure this out. We'll get through this together. And so a really strong sense of, of uh, community comes out of that. Uh, a second question we wanted to talk about is, you know, what does Bridge endeavor to accomplish? And I don't think I've ever actually had this conversation with Catherine and Russell. So I, I'm really curious about your perspective. What do you think we're doing in Bridge? What's it trying to accomplish? There'll, there'll be... A number of answers to this, but one of the things that comes up for me is that, again, what I just said earlier about accessibility, it, it makes education accessible to people who did not feel they could do it, accomplishment, sit in the classroom, write a paper, um, do research, you know, it's making it available to them. So, so they're not struggling with, oh my God, how do I pay for it, right? How do, how do I come up with the money to make this happen, you know? Uh, folks just want to sit in a classroom and can we talk and learn from each other? So I, th I think what it endeavors to do is to, is to help people to see um, and feel that, wow, education is accessible to me. 
right? Then, then after that, they make the decision about where they go next. And many of them do make that decision to go in community colleges or whatever their local work is going to, going to do. But it helps those folks who have not had this experience before. They dropped out of high school. They're a single mother. They were bullied wherever they were. They were formerly incarcerated um, or, or living in a, in, a, in a substance abuse house. And they're saying, what's the next step for me? And this helps them to see it is possible, you know. So we 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 help them to see that you may start out with writing, literally writing two lines on a paper, literally writing a paragraph on a paper, and saying to them, "Stay with us. We will work with you. By the time you're done, you will get up to that five to ten page paper, right? But your two lines right now mean something. Your one paragraph means something." So people feel like, wow, I got something done when I did one paragraph. Yes. I can go on and on with this. So my cats are <laughs> <laughs> I'm nodding because uh, I, I, in teaching writing, I, I think about that a lot. And I've thought about this question in different ways over the years. And some years I really struggled thinking about um, the purpose of bridge and what that means um, for the students, what that means uh, for me as a participant in bridge and the ways I do. And these days, um, it it's uh, I think about it a lot in the classroom as a teacher. And one thing that I hope uh, students walk away with after the classes, it's something we kind of already touched on. It's not, um, I don't hope they remember the learning objectives exactly, or uh, that they um, even that they finish a paper. I hope uh, right. that what students walk away with is uh, another strategy or another set of strategies strategies to navigate the system of education, um, and and hopefully at the very least the strategy of um, coming together as a group. Uh, talking with their classmates that bring it to bridge um, so that if um, if and when they move on to whatever is next, whether it's community college or um, uh, a, a community organizing uh, 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 event or uh, position, that, that that is something that they can bring with them. Um, that's my hope these days. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to add another piece to this that's not, that's not uh, directly related to the classroom. But, but it's a message to the university. And, and this is something that I, I can't say that this was their thinking in the very beginning, but with, for, 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 for Sherry and David, but it says to the university, this is what social justice looks like, right? So we call ourselves a social justice institution and then people come in and pay however much we pay and rack up all these bills and we get great education. It's a great environment, but we also go to the next step and say, and now let's open up our doors to those people that we study about, that we talk about, that are disenfranchised, all that language that we use. Let's open up those doors and it says to the university, this is what social justice looks like. We are living out what we talk about and teach about in all of our classrooms. So I, I want to amen both what Russell and Catherine have said on this, and then and then just pitch in a a, a little bit more. Um, you know, when I said yes to starting Bridge, um, a lot of what motivated me was that you know I came out of uh, about as white trash a background as you possibly come from. And um, nobody, nobody anywhere in my family had ever finished high school. And because of my own stubbornness, I somehow ended up with a PhD. And I, one of the things that that means to me is I have a, just a profound sense of the ways in which education opens up possibilities in life and expands your horizons of possibility. Um, and I'm just forever grateful and humbled by the opportunities I had and the people who kicked me in the ass at the right time and pointed me in, in, in a better direction than I was headed and, and helped me uh, get where I am. And so now I'm, you know, at the time, here I am the chair of the undergraduate studies program 
and uh, and there's this opportunity. And and all I could say was hell yes, you know, uh, because it's you know we, we to to use Russ's word, you know, to be able to give access to to remove obstacles and barriers uh, to the best of our ability uh, meant a, a great deal to me. Um, and I'll tell you this story real quickly. You know, to me, Bridge is a, uh, and, and Russ brought this up, that it's so social justice work. Um, we know the inequities in education from kindergarten all the way through higher education and, and even before kinder, preschool all the way to, to, to higher education. Um, racial inequities, uh, economic inequities, um, all sorts of inequities. And when, when I would be hiring faculty or interviewing a student who wanted to intern in the program, it was really important to me that they understood that this is not charity work. This is social justice work. Mm -hmm. And so many of them would be, oh, I'm just so honored to be, you know, to be, have a chance to work with students like you. And it's like, yeah, I'm not hiring you. <laughs> Like, like this is not charity. This is not to make you feel good. This is because it's the right thing to do. This is because, you know, we're a social justice institution with a, with a mission and we have an opportunity to do this work. So, you know, if you can get on board with that, great. If you can't, well, God bless you. And the one other thing I'll throw in here is that it's not just about education to me. One of the things, questions that I was continually asked when I was the, 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 the director in the program is why, why are you teaching the humanities to this population? Mm -hmm. And why aren't you teaching them job skills, computer skills, you know, what, what, whatever, so that they can get a job. And part of my answer to that is the humanities are a 2,500 year long conversation about what it means to be human mm -hmm. and what is the good for us. And this is a population that has been systematically excluded from that conversation. And so that's, that is part of what Bridge is. It, it's, it's trying to provide access at the, the table of the public sphere mm -hmm. for these students and encouraging them to enter into the public sphere uh, whatever that entails, going to museums that they would have never thought of going to, you know, participating in, in, in college uh, events and lectures that they would have never thought of going to, whatever it was, but entering more fully into the public sphere so that their voices were at the table and we could change this conversation about what does it mean to be human and what is the good for us. Um, so that, that is vital to me as well. David, I'd like to just add to that, that um, that, that conversation uh, in the, over these last few years, and Catherine and I have been very uh, concerned about ensuring that we have a diversity of faculty that lead those conversations, <clears throat> right? So, um, so, so many of you um, uh, know Erin uh, Aubrey Kaplan, right? She leads our literature class, and Cheka Ababukari, um, who, who's a wonderful Afrocentric, be centered, uh, philosopher, teacher, um, guide, guru who teaches in our philosophy section, <clears throat> and then Fabian uh, who teaches in our art history section. Uh, then Catherine teaches in in, um, in all the writing sections. She brings that great level of expertise. And then I just want to say this is my first year teaching in Bridge, but anyway, <laughs> and I'm excited about that. But the point that I want to make here is that in, in having these conversations, which are so rich we have the diversity of faculty to help lead those conversations. Thank you, Russ and Catherine. Uh, our third question we agreed on was, so what, what have been some of the challenges that Bridge has faced and, and you know, how has Bridge grown um, as they've endeavored, as we have endeavored to, to meet those challenges? So, um... One thing that comes to mind of one of the most recent challenges uh, that Russ already brought up was the pandemic. Um, when uh, in the start of 2020, 
Bridge was held on campus in person. And it was also, uh, I think, the most analog of any program in the Antioch system. Mm -hmm. Everything from student applications uh, to the way we did registration was all done on paper. And um, that transition was a very difficult one for the students who had, uh, while they were trying to learn how to do class online, were also facing uh, barriers like food insecurity uh, or housing insecurity in the in the middle of um, that that frightening time um, for for all of us. Um, and um, I remember that there was a student who didn't know how to use a computer. And so we had lots of conversations. It took almost every department on campus. Um, Sandy Lee uh, supported uh, students with equipment. Um, and there are students uh, who did not uh, use computers uh, in the beginning of 2020 who still email me uh, every week. Um, uh, and uh, and we talk about that time. Um, I think it was a big it, it was a big uh, growth opportunity for Bridge as well uh, because we had not introduced computer skills or uh, the the need to use a computer, although we had a, a computer lab on campus. And um, uh, one thing that I learned from that was we had to uh, really think about how to bring people in at many different levels of uh, comfort when it came to software, uh, internet access, and knowledge of how to use that. So that was a, um, a big uh, challenge that I think we faced recently. Yeah. And I would like to, um, and, and as we, uh, let me just share on this piece just for a second before I go into another subject matter here. Um, accessibility really came up as an issue when we were dealing with Jamaica and we were dealing with, with, with South Africa. We really had to think about that for them and how this would work. And, uh, and, and the reason why this year, this year we have two students from Jamaica and we don't have more is because internet access is just not readily accessible. You know, we had one student who was up in Roses Hill, um, sake, I call it sacred ground up there because that's where the that's where uh, the enslaved people who came to Jamaica, they escaped up into Roses Hill. Uh, but up in Roses Hill, the Internet access is not good at all. And the person that I was working with said, Russ, we can try it, but I don't think so. And as it turned out, the student was not able to, to continue on. So, so th those are some issues that we have to address there. But I think the other piece that that was a, uh, uh, an issue for Bridge, and that is the issue of race and gender. You know, gender, gender um, equality and acceptance and embracing, and so on. That was an issue. And um, and in the early days, David, which he'll share in his own on this, and and I've certainly seen, where students were not always accepting of different people in the classroom. You know, and um, and and it would be hard at times for LGBT students or or Latinx students speaking different languages and so on. 2014 was a turning point, and this is why I want to raise this. 2014 was a major turning point, and and as I was working in the bridge program at that time, I, I took Catherine and I had a conversation about we should be saying to people exactly who's coming into the classroom. I remember us having this specific conversation. We don't say to people that you're gonna be in a classroom um, with people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. You're gonna be in a classroom with people who are single mothers in the classroom. You're gonna be in the classroom with people who speak different languages. So what Catherine and I did at that time, along with the, um, the, the other faculty, is we, and I'm gonna to go to a share screen, we actually came up with language that we share. And we bring this up today. We bring this up in, in, the, um, in the conversations that we have with students before they come into Bridge. We bring this conversation up with them when we do orientation. And this is the piece that we speak to directly. I'm gonna to go to a share screen now with you. And we specifically say, who are my classmates? Everybody is aware, you know, we're not thinking about it. We're telling you exactly what it is. Bridge celebrates diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then we go on to say, who are my fellow classmates? Bridge class is filled with a diverse community of learners, including people from all walks of life. Students hear this from the very beginning. We have different stories and struggles in life, sometimes extreme struggles. We are of diverse races, ages, genders, ethnicities, and classes. We speak different languages. We may be from many different faith traditions and, and some people may not identify with any faith traditions. 
Then we say some of us are parents and grandparents. Some of us may have disabilities, neurodiversities. Some of us may be veterans, teachers, community leaders. Some of us may identify as the LGBTQI in our in our in our uh, in the classroom. Uh, the main thing here is that in, in the bridge community, we celebrate diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I raise this because coming out of 2014, help yourself. Of, Please help yourself. Okay, I'm sorry. So, so, I, so I raise this because coming out of 2014, I mean, we, there were some, you know, lively conversations. I'll put it in a nice way. Others will say it a little bit differently, but there were lively conversations in the classroom, and some of them extended out into the courtyard. And we needed to we needed to rectify this because we were not going to say um, if you identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, you should be quiet. We were not going to say um, if you can't speak English, you should not be in the classroom. We were not going to say that. Um, so we did let everybody know the message that I just shared with you and the importance of honoring humanity and everyone that comes in in in, in the room. And I share and I would say to them many times that um, and there is a line that I draw. And if you cross that line, and I do not say this smiling because I want everybody to just to understand and embrace the seriousness of this. If you cross the line and bringing hurt and harm to somebody, um, it, it will be addressed because it was important that people know right up front, you know, who we are and what we're all about. And I and I will share with you, and I'll say this here because many may know or may not know, I have no problem with coming out and saying, and I'm a gay man embracing all of this. I don't have a problem with saying that in any of my classrooms because I want people, and I don't have a problem with saying to people that um, about my own learning challenges because I want people to know in this learning community, I am with you. I walk with you. I stand with you as we do this together. Let's honor and respect each other as we go down this journey together. That, that approach that we took uh, back then has really shifted our consciousness and how we move together in, in the bridge classroom because we were right up front with it and we let people know while we, we are embracing everybody, come as you are, but there are some lines that, that we're not going to allow anyone to cross. I think uh, Roger has a hand up for a while here. Roger, did you want to say something? Yes, I did want to say something. Well, who didn't know that, right? Uh, it's good to see uh, a lot of folks that I know and love and haven't seen in five years. And in that time, the world has changed. We've been through a pandemic and well, I guess we all have to get comfortable because I don't see us going back. So, um, and I agree with everything that has been said previously. Um, um, you know, I know uh, I have very close relationship with Aaron. So, and and I also know Cheka pretty well through Dr. Gills. And um, I actually recruited Fabian. So I know they have in their own um, integrated subtle ways have to have addressed these issues. It's part of who they are and how they teach. <clears throat> the issue I wanna bring up is one of diversity and inclusion which I have always agreed with, but I have recently rethought it um, because I, I have a group of friends and you know we were all brought in the 40s, so we were 18 in 1960. You're talking about catching the wave. <laughs> you know, we saw it all. We saw the, the whole movie. Um, uh, and we always talk about the white man. You know, so these conversations, they may be new to Antioch, but they're not new to the students that come into Antioch, irrespective of their level of education. So, and what's missing in the conversation about diversity and inclusion is white supremacy. That is the elephant in the room, and it's about time we shown the light on the elephant because well 
everybody else knows, but the educators don't address it, you know? And in a conversation recently it, it, uh, among my friends and colleagues, which I've known over 60 years, you know, diversity and inclusion, and I, I found nothing wrong with it up to this point. Um, but yes, I did find that, you know, that we weren't talking about it, but I understood that. But um, recently, you, you, you know, we have these things that say power concedes nothing without a struggle. And it seems like we dance around white supremacy and we all know it's right there. And it's more subtle in Antioch, but you know, a friend of mine once said um, that um, in the South, they love the people, but hate the race. In the North, they love the race, but hate the people. But everybody wants to hold on to power, meaning the dominant culture. And diversity and inclusion, and I was part of creating society and the individual. So I, under, I, you know, I understand and agree with where we, where we were at that time. But that's like uh, the slave going to the slave master and saying, how about a white girl and a cigarette break and I'll be right back, you know? Um, so we have to talk about it. And particularly since we're going international, because people of color know about this. It's white people that don't know about it uh, or don't want to talk about it. And I don't mean all white people, all anybody. I'm just throwing that out there. It's time to tell the truth because the world's about to blow up. Um, and by not, and actually, at some point, we have to go back and integrate, I think, into bridge where it all came from, which is the British class system. You know, we know about Australia, but we don't talk about, as David said, the white trash that came here. So I just want to take the lid off that. And uh, and because we talk about it all the time in communities of culture, in communities of color, but we have to, I mean, we know it's there. We've been trying to tell white people, this is, you know, this is what happens. This is why there's a mystery behind John Kennedy's death. Well, he signed an executive agreement that allowed people of color to go to white schools. You know, that's one of many things he did, but I think that's, you know, we think that's what got him killed. So there's all kinds of conversations that could bubble up if it was okay to talk about white, white supremacy because it's in our faces now. And finally, everybody sees it. So I'll stop there and, and leave some room, which, you know, I hate to give up the mic, but <laughs> okay. We, we, we know this about you, Roger. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, as, as since Roger's voice is in the room, I would just want to acknowledge two people who are here who I haven't seen for a while that have been huge supporters of Bridge over the years. Roger, one of them, and the other, uh, Lisa Lapore, our former uh, librarian. So wonderful to see both of you. Um, I, I want to say, a, I thought was just one thing. Now it sounds like three things to me real quickly. One is a super quick story in relation to a point that Russ was raising about the need for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it comes from the first year of Bridge. Um, when we started Bridge, and as I said, we did not know what we were doing. We were building it as we went. And there was a bus strike. And it was like, oh, damn, now what are we going to do? So, well, what we do, those of us that had cars, we ferried people back and forth all over the city. And I had this old 240 Volvo. That's about as white and academic a car as you could possibly have. Uh, the, you know, those station wagons, right? There's old beat up, only started half the time. That's what I had. 
And I'm driving people back and forth who live downtown. Um, and I've one night I've got this Latino guy sitting in the front seat next to me. I've got this uh, black lesbian in the back seat. And I've got this uh, other Latino guy uh, in the back seat. The two Latino guys are in rival gangs. And we're and I'm driving him home. And the guy next to me just starts laughing and he won't stop. And 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 I and I was like, what 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 the hell is going on with you, man? And he said, he said, I if I told anybody what I was doing, no one would believe me. I'm sitting in this white guy's Volvo wagon with my arch enemy in the back seat and this lesbian woman behind me like this is impossible this is impossible and he said you know and we're all reading plato like try to make sense out of that so it was this beautiful moment that i've never ever uh, forgotten a second thing real quickly to roger's point about white supremacy um amen right so the that's part of the curriculum of bridge when we built it it was how did we get to where we are right and how did we get to a state of white supremacy how did these philosophers this literature uh this art build and support and sustain the perspectives of white supremacy and then what are the voices that challenge that so I couldn't agree more about the importance of having that baked into the cake. Um, and then to answer my original question, which was, you know, what are the challenges that Bridges has, has, has faced? Um, and this is a dicey uh, story I'm going to tell, but I think it's important uh, that it's told. To me, the big challenge was... Um, during my time leading the program is that we had an academic dean who was determined to crush the bridge program at the time it's called the che program i named it uh che uh, community humanities education program didn't roll off the tongue very well but it was a nice nod to che Guevara. Um, and the dean wanted it closed she thought it had, you know, it just, it, it wasn't an academic program. There's no, you know, we should not be issuing credit for this program. It was beneath us. Um, and so I battled her and I lost. Um, and that was a hard moment, a really, really hard moment. And to Sherry Fuse's credit, she and I worked to continue Bridge, and this is what, or, or continue Che, and this is when Che became Bridge. So we we formed our own board, we got our own 5013C, and we just kept going without Antioch. And we could not offer credit, but we weren't going to let Antioch crush this program. And and I said this is a dicey story because we don't like to think of Antioch in this way, but all institutions are institutions and they all have people in them. And if there's people involved, wonderful, surprising, glorious things can happen and difficult challenges can happen. Um, we got rid of that Dean and we renegotiated our relationship with uh, Antioch and we came back. And I think that's just an important story for Antioch's community to know. Sometimes you've got to go up against your own institution to do what's right and to try to make that institution a better institution. Yeah. Um, last thing, uh, our last question, and then we'll shut up and turn to over to your questions and comments. Uh, but I want to ask Catherine and, and Russell you know, what do you see as some of the exciting possibilities in the in future for Bridge? I, I would say what, what we're doing on this um, national, international stage, 
you know, I think I think there's an there's an opportunity there. We have to figure out how we how we continue to keep those doors open. Uh, the LA Public Library, the, the student that's with us from uh, South Africa, came to us through the LA Public Library. The students that have come to us um, nationally, and well, sorry, I want to say nationally outside of California, have come through us through a Clemente. Uh, placing us on their website as a virtual environment for classroom, right? So that that's how the students have come to us. So we've we've kind of we've opened up this door uh, since the pandemic started. So we have to ask ourselves how do we how do we move forward with this? And Catherine and I are in this conversation with others now. You know, is it a hybrid environment? Do we have both the classroom and then we have the the um, the virtual environment? What what does that look like for us? But, there, but, it, but it says to us, it says to me that there's definitely um, Antioch University um, because we are part of Antioch. So Antioch University has this amazing program that, um, that can be made available to other people. You know, we had a conversation with Seattle about this. Who knows the kind of conversation that'll happen with the new institution that's coming in. But we have a program that, that really speaks to um, our mission in the world. And so how do we continue to, to build and evolve this? But doors have been opened already and people are excited about this beyond Los Angeles County. So, so how, do we, how do we build on that? And we're having conversation about that piece now. <clears throat> if, if I could add something that I think is a, um, a, a great new change, we have rest teaching bridge students this year. <laughs> I'm really grateful for that. Um, I think it's a a, a great development, um, and I know the students are so excited uh, to be part of that class. Uh, we also um, this year we're partnering with Clemente, and we're able to offer um, uh, classes uh, with um, with Seattle and some other Clemente programs around the country to alums uh, from both Clemente and Bridge. So um, it's through a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. So that's also something uh, new that we have um, that I think is a, a new possibility for the future of Bridge. More uh, opportunities to collaborate like that. Yeah, if, if I could share more about this, um, the, the, the piece that I'm teaching now, because um, some may or may not be aware of it. But we, 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 we intentionally went into conversation with Mihi about how we proceed forward with our one unit Saturday option, uh, which was formerly uh, bridge service learning um, that, that our colleague Rosa um, uh, uh, shepherded for, for so many years in such an amazing way. And, and we determined that we needed to do a shift so we could give our students an opportunity to, to select a one unit option each quarter. Right, so they can opt in this quarter and opt out next quarter if they wanted to. That was totally up to them. Uh, so this quarter, uh, in working with um, Anna, thank you so much for being here, and Mihi, uh, the 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 one unit course was offered to bridge students and to undergraduate students. And this first course uh, was uh, communications in the workplace. Uh, we, we I, I just held the class on uh, Friday and Saturday. I'm fresh off the class, and there were 13, 13 students um, in the classroom. And then next quarter, um, we're, we're developing a one-unit workshop that come. It's an element that comes out of my um, uh, nonprofit advancement, and, and it's around fundraising, and it's very, very relevant um, to to everyone that's going to be in there. The way it's going to be presented, that'll be a one-unit offering um, in winter. And again, that'll be open to um, bridge students and to and to uh, undergraduate students. And the feedback that I received just on this past weekend is that people and one student in particular was saying to me, I love this environment because it was very, very diverse. They really enjoyed being in, in, in that space. So there's possibilities here. It's our first year doing it. This is the very first year, the very first class. So, so, I, so I know Anna's gonna want to, to, to work with me and dissect and understand how it all went. Um, but this is the first year that, that we've done it. And I'm excited about being in the classroom in this one year opportunity. Thank you, uh, Catherine and Russ. I I'm, don't have anything to add to that other than, you know, somewhere around year seven, I knew it was time for me to get out of the way and hand bridge off and uh, see what it would become 
with somebody else driving it. Uh, and, and what you heard from Catherine and Russ are examples of the good that can happen when you get out of the way. Uh, Sarah Beth, any questions in the chat that you want to bring in? I was just going to say that uh, thanks, Catherine, for the segue to Sue's comment in the chat. Uh, Sue says, I'd love to hear Mary Lou Finley speak to Antioch Seattle's Clemente Veterans Initiative. Uh, Mary Lou, would you share about this if you, if you feel inclined? Um, hello. Uh, sure, I'd be happy to say a few things. Um, <clears throat> this program. Uh, is now in an abeyance of sorts, but has been going for about the last 10 years. I was trying to think how long, but almost that, that that's about right. Um, and we operated on campus for a long time under the Clemente, first under the BARD um, framework, and then it's been Antioch granting the credits the last few years. So we've had a little more flexibility. Um, and I would just say, a couple of things. Um, I taught US history in this class and worked hard to do a kind of um, people's history version of American history, which was news to most of the students. And so that was an interesting perspective. I had a lot of black history, um, particularly because we'd had a number of African-American um, students over the years. Um, one of the things I think was most important was the writing, which I did not teach, um, but I appreciated what uh, was said earlier about just getting one paragraph down on the paper can be really useful. Um, I had some experiences with students, one I particularly remember where um, I really, he did a nice job of writing, but I really wanted him to put his own perspective into the paper and he just couldn't do it. And I had to think, okay, he's stuck at a certain place. He was able to write a three-page paper, and that was huge. Um, and he got, and uh, he understood what he was doing, but he couldn't take that next step. Um, and I understand that sometimes that's a kind of trauma response of sorts. As of, I know it's an intellectual development issue, it can be, but um, also. Um, but and I had another student at one point who, um, who was really. Um, being able to begin to process some of his uh, experiences, which were very painful. He'd been an Afghan Afghanistan um, veteran. And finally, I just realized, even for my U.S. history class, he can't write anything about U.S. history until he tells that story. And so I said, you know, just tell the story. That's part of U.S. history too. So do that for your work. So we tried to really pick up uh, where people were um, with whatever they were bringing to this situation. Um, the other thing is we had a number of students who kept coming back. I mean, we tried to expand the curriculum, but I had people who came several times to my U.S. history class. And what we realized from that when it was in person is that it was really a support group for them. Besides, we had pizza, so it was also dinner. Um, and that they were still working through those things. I try to change the class enough so that it was different each time, a little bit at least, um, to accommodate th th that. But I thought that, that that's another way to think about it is it's a different, um, th there, that was serving a real need for some of the people who were, um, the one student I remember in particular who um, kept coming back I finally learned he was a Vietnam veteran. He was in his seventies and he was really still processing what had happened to him as a result of Vietnam. And learning US history, um, trying to deal with Thomas Jefferson and Jefferson's contradictions uh, and still hanging on to the Declaration of Independence um, as you know, that he was still struggling with those things as a veteran. And so I, I thought we were able to give a space um, for people to both be learning, but also working through some of the, the really traumatic experiences that they had had. Um, so maybe that's, maybe I'll just stop there. If people have other particular questions, um, I'd be happy to speak some more. Thanks, Mary Lou. Uh -huh. Roger's hand is exhausted. Go ahead, Roger. <laughs> 
I would love Mary Lou to hear your version of the Revolutionary War because I'm ashamed to say I, you know, I grew up in the class when they were talking about George Washington and cherry trees and never lying, you, you know, that fairy tale. Mm -hmm. And it had, I, I was shocked to find I had nothing to do with Boston or harbors. Well, it had a lot to do with harbors, but it was, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> uh, let, let me go on. I'll, I'll leave the history to you, but I'll, I'll just say this. It's really important to tell the truth about that. <laughs> and, and if the truth about American history were ever told, then I don't know if we'd be where we were today. You know, um, the, the horrors of enslavement were ever really told. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know any white people named Washington or Jefferson, or, you know, or, or, or Jackson, but I know a whole lot of black people. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the myth, how they flipped this thing about black man raping white women, and I yeah. oh, don't get me, don't, don't get me started <laughs> on the slave quarters. So anyway, but there's a reason why some black people can pass for white, and some people are jet black, and that has to do with American history, and it's just not told. So. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that would help a lot, um, as well as, um, and I'll get off this. And my what I really wanted to share about was actually shorter, I think. Uh, but <laughs> but um, I recently ran into a young woman who had just finished her bachelor's, and I asked her what it was, uh, what her what her major major was. And she said, decision science. I said, oh, where'd you go to school? She said, Carnegie Mellon. You know, and I said, decision science, what, what is that? It sounds, so it's a combination of sociology and psychology and anthropology and all the social sciences, which I always kind of thought made sense, you know, but we, we teach those things in silos. And, and I think we're behind the times. Um, because they all intersect. But anyway, so that's what I wanted to say. But about that, the other thing I want to comment on is um, how we teach, you know, the canon. Oh, by the way, uh, they, um, I, I actually saw the original article in Harper's Magazine about the Clemente courses and was I was talking to George Bermudez one day and, and was surprised to find he had actually worked with um, Earl Shores <clears throat> while he was developing that course. I don't know if George is still there, but, but I grew up right down the street from City College of New York where he went to school. So we had a, you know, but anyway. Um, so, and I'm, and I'm sure that knowing Cheka and Fabian, and I know Aaron for sure, have their own way of getting around civilization, starting with the Greeks. <laughs> but, you know, but that's part of the, the problem. It's, mm -hmm. we don't acknowledge where the Greeks got it from the Egyptians um, through Socrates and that whole stolen legacy, like Africa was some dark place that nobody, some dark, ignorant place until the Greeks came, you know, um, um, that has to be, um, that has to somehow be integrated. Um, you know, things like Hippocrates being the father of medicine when Imhotep, 7,000 years later, previously, you know, let your food be your medicine. Let your medicine be your food. They're very sophisticated civilizations. Oh, and by the way, Egypt is actually in Africa. You know, that's, you know, part of white supremacy is 
is not only keeping Africa the dark continent until the Greeks came, but separating Egypt from Africa. And so anyway, I just wanted to throw that in. These are my latest things that, you know, keep me alive and keep me in touch with my own anger. So anyway, <laughs> I want to throw thank that out there. Thank, thank you, Roger. And I'm glad for those things, if that's what does it. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I am uh, noticing that it's five, a little bit after five, and we need to uh, let folks uh, leave if they need to for mm -hmm. other commitments. But those of you who'd like to stick around and continue this yeah. conversation, please do. So we'll just take a few seconds here to kind of regroup. And, and before people go, I don't want to lose this opportunity to, ho hopefully this is inspiring people to get involved in Bridge in some way. Bridge needs all the help it can get. And I don't know how many students are here, but we need teaching assistants in, in the program. And there's probably a lot of faculty here. Um, to talk to your students, talk to your advisees about how they can get involved in Bridge and as teaching assistants, earn some units, uh, meet their uh, self, what is it, out of non-classroom learning requirement, uh, and, and, and so on. I just wanted to get that in before people disappeared. Yeah. David, I also uh, dropped into the chat on aulabridge.org you know, for people who, who want to know more about Bridge. There's a lot of information in there, including ways to donate, but go to aulabridge.org, and that's in your chat. You can certainly share that with everyone. Thank you, Russell. I noticed in the chat um, that there's a few comments here. Uh, one of them is uh, Kat. Kat, you wanted to share something? Is Kat still around? I'm just very excited about um, Bridge and I'll be kind of reaching out to um, Sue and Mary Lou about the veterans aspect of it, as well as getting in touch with AULA. I'm the new director of writing support for the university. Um, I've worked with Bridge in a couple of different contexts at other institutions, mostly with um, traditional age undergrads. Um, but as somebody who whose partner is active duty military and struggling to finish um a bachelor's degree while still in service i love learning about options like bridge and then thinking about what can i do to also help with that how can writing support expand a little bit more on the amazing work that um mihi andrea and um lacoya have done at aula i'm in the san diego area so um, watching my students come in through the Tijuana borders to UCSD where I was working previously and helping them kind of navigate some of the hidden curriculum that we don't often talk about. And I love that this particular version of Bridge really puts that hidden curriculum and the academic and cultural capital necessary for success kind of at the forefront um, and makes that a friendly spot to form a cohort and to form a community. Um, I know for a lot of returning learners, my husband included, um, finding a community that understands what it means to go back to school to sacrifice that time can be very difficult. And I think that this program is just like, it just makes my heart so very happy. And to be able to start seeing ways that the that writing support can expand our support over the summertime and through Bridge, through offering some touch points um that i don't know that's it <laughs> glad you're here thank you and welcome to you cat to our community and to messy conversations we're glad to have you and uh, love to hear about resources and make connections with with our program so thank you uh, i see a hand up here uh uh najla is that correct yeah yes it is um, I just wanted to bear witness to the absolute transformational spirit and power of Bridge. I was graduated from Bridge um, the year 2014, 
And from there, I went on to um, Springfield College and got my ma uh, bachelor's degree um, in human services. And I came back to Bridge, I mean, excuse me, came back to Antioch and was graduated last year from the MAP program. And I'll be coming back to Antioch in July of next year, um, pursuing my degree, PhD, PsyD in either leadership and change or a doctorate of education. But Bridge was something for me that absolutely gave me life. It gave me direction. And as you can probably tell, well, I don't know. I'm not a baby. <laughs> I'm, I'm the rifle age, rifle age of 72 in January. Um, but Bridge for me literally gave me life. And I continue to contribute um, my love for Bridge um, as an assistant. I, I do time management workshops for them and also stress management. And as long as I have breath, I will breathe for Bridge. So I just want to say that, oh, and my career goal for Antioch is to teach society and the individual. <laughs> I need help. Somebody help me to do this. Um, but for me, uh, that was the one class that I'm like, eh, no, we need to do this a different way. So I volunteer. We, we have okay. you on a recording, so we will share your <laughs> offer. <laughs> That's wonderful. Please. Okay, I but can, I just want to say, I just want to say that I appreciate Russell and Catherine for allowing me to be present in the classroom. And I'm sincere when I say my heart is with bridges and my breath is with bridge. And thank you so much for these few minutes. Thank you for those wonderful words. I, I just want to. If I can just add really quick uh, with what Najla just said, because that's an important piece to know that bridge is also a pathway for those students who want to, and we encourage that. We have had uh, students um, who have gone from bridge to a BA to an MA and be the primary speaker at commencement, that, that, a major transformation for this woman. And we've had a number of uh, uh, um, occasions like that. But we absolutely, I am a believer that bridge is a pathway for those students who want to continue on with their education. And when they bring that up to me, um, I, I try to open up any door I can to help get them through. Thank you. I, 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 I'm so happy to hear Najla's story. Um, so thank you for bringing that into the space. It reminded me of one of my favorite bridge students uh, from, I think, the first year, uh, Edie. And Edie, Edie applied to bridge thinking it was a Bible study class. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't come with strong academic skills. And she made her way through the bridge program and then she wanted to come to Antioch and I said no you're not ready go to community college she applied again the next year I said no you're not ready keep going to community college she applied again the following year I said no you're not ready she applied again the fourth year and I was like you're ready let's go she completed her undergraduate degree then she went on, got her master's degree, and her her burden was always for uh, to have a shelter for single women, uh, single mothers. Um, and you know what what a what a what a road, right? To start from thinking you're going to a Bible study class <laughs> to, to 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 where she ended up. So thank you for your story, Nadja. Can I add one more thing? I just want to add a story about Catherine, KP. When I was um, the assistant in the classroom the year after I was graduated, there were, you know, we had uh, snacks and stuff in the back of the room and there was always some food available to the students. And I noticed that this one student would always, like she would take trays of food and pour it in her purse. And I'll never forget one night we had pizza <laughs> and she folded the pizza in half and then she folded it in a quarter and she put the whole pizza in her purse. So I went to Catherine, I was like, and you know, I, I admit I've grown since then, but I said to Catherine, how is it that she's stealing all the food? I mean, what, what is this? Why, you know, she just put a whole pizza in her purse. And Catherine <laughs> said, well, <laughs> maybe we just need to buy more food. 
Mm. Maybe we need to set out more food. And that that single conversation changed everything in me about my perception of bridge, yeah. right? And yeah. I found out later, yeah. I gave that particular student a ride home. Now I know that it, I shouldn't have done that, but back then I gave her a ride and I realized she didn't have a home. She had me drop her off on the corner in front of the shelter because she had arrived too late to go inside. Mm -hmm. So that was her only meal. Right. That was she came to bridge to eat and she gave one of the most profound, prolific uh, capstone presentations of all the students. So I just want to say that bridge is more than just a classroom. It is literally a bridge. OK, mm. I'm done. Mm. <laughs> I you. love that. I want to validate. Catherine's, not that it needs validation, but I can't find another word, but the heart that she puts into this program, the heart and soul. I can remember having four hour conversations with her on Thursdays and, uh, and uh, those were enriching. And, and please, please find a way to have Najla teach society and the individual. Because this is a full grown woman <laughs> with the ability to process information and warp speed in the moment and give loving, accurate, pure answers. And I don't know if you've ever heard her life story, but it is one of the most interesting I have ever heard, you know, um, so, I mean, this woman has a background, but she is a baby though, because I just turned 80, <laughs> you know, and, uh, David Tripp, um, I thought she was going to tell the story about the woman who uh, went from homeless to a PhD at Yale. You got some of the facts wrong, but that's a good story too. <laughs> you know, she, she, uh, Roger, so so you know, she that was Aura, and Aura actually has been one of our guest conversationalists here at Messy Conversations uh, okay. to talk talk about immigration issues. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, they say when the facts contradict the legend, print the legend. So exactly. I, I gotta go. And this has been wonderful. It's good to reconnect with Bridge. This is a special place and a special feeling, you know. Uh, so it's just uh just good to be back. You know? Thank you, Roger, so, for so. we have a we have uh we welcome as much validation as we can possibly welcome at any point. So on that same note. In the chat, uh, Barbara, you had some wonderful words. Would you like to share what you wrote? Well, I think uh, she did mention also that she can't um, speak to it. So, but it was so maybe you can read it. Yeah, there. I'll just read it. Here. So Barbara says, "This is such an active social justice and inclusion, uh, an inclusive approach to education." Congratulations on the ongoing success of this important program. In psychotherapy, there is a body of controversial research that speaks to the variable of paying something for services, no matter how small the amount and how this influences the outcome in a beneficial way versus paying nothing. Do you see any parallel here for the bridge program and do students ever want to offer something for their education? I imagine the motivation to grow in meaningful ways intellectually and socially is highly valued on its own and outweighs whether one pays anything. But I was curious about this from your collective experiences. Thank you, Barbara. I would, I would love to jump in with a quote from a student um, uh, years ago. Uh, at the very end of the year, uh, he came up to me after the final presentations were over and he said, you know, you tell us that Bridge is free, but it's not free. Um, it takes a lot of hard work, a lot of 
a lot of commitment and a lot of uh, dedication. And I find myself uh, repeating that to students who have applied to the program because um, it may not cost any money, but it does take a lot of commitment. And um, some of the students in our class this year, since we have um, uh, some geographic, uh, we're, we're all around the world. We, we have students uh, logging in at midnight at 3 a.m. Um, and that uh, that is definitely a cost. <laughs> it may not be money. Um, I also apologize for the cattail in my face right now. Sorry <laughs> about that. Yeah. So, and I'd love to add, first, thanks for the question. And I agree with Catherine. And I would add, you know, what we try to cultivate in the bridge community is a spirit of generosity. And there's so many ways to be generous. And so, you know, students will bring food. I remember a guy who every class he would bring day old donuts. You know, he'd pick them up some, I don't know, but the day old donuts. And that was his thing. You know, it cost him a buck for a dozen of them or something like that. Um, and that was his thing. Students, students also contribute by taking care of one another, as Catherine was saying. Um, supporting one another, giving one another a, a, a drive home, picking somebody up when they've fallen down, agreeing to to make the coffee that night or you know whatever it is there's and, and so people are encouraged to participate it's our community, right So community means the relationships run all directions, not just from the faculty down. And that's vital to the life of bridge as I understand it. Yeah, when students realized that um, that there were need for resources in the classroom, uh, they would they would bring that resource information, whether it be housing, food, whatever the situation was. Um, uh, students would come together and say, "Oh, I'll bring this. I'll bring this," and so that they hear the issue and they're responsive to the issue while they're in the classroom. I'll also add that this year, the class is sharing recipes with each other. So um, <laughs> maybe uh, I, I'll get the class's permission to share the recipes wider in the Antioch community. I'll see if the group agrees. <laughs> um, I'm looking through the chat and there's just lots of love for the bridge program and for these collaborations. And uh, I don't see um, there's just a call for, you know, uh, letting people know about workshops or resources that could be helpful for your students from CAT and uh, a shout out from Mark. Uh, and Mary Lou has some, some more great things to say. Uh, so I don't see anything else here that is asking a question, but if there's anybody who wants to do that before we uh, we end for today, feel free to jump in at this point. I, I, I just wanna, I'm sorry. I, I just want to add in here that, um, and, I, and I say this to bridge students as we get to the end of the year, <clears throat> and I want to say it to you all here, if bridge in any way has moved you and has touched your life, um, be a voice to share that with someone else. Right, we don't, we don't want Bridge to be a secret and something that we just hold here um, in Los Angeles. Now we're in other areas, right? So, so a Bridge has touched your life. And I love saying this to students because they can be the ones that changes somebody else's life. So we open that door so they have permission. But I wanna say the same thing to all of you here. Every, everyone in this room has resources in some form or fashion. So a Bridge has touched your life, changed your life over the years at all. Uh, we invite you to share aulabridge.org. Shamelessly, I say that to you. We invite everyone to share aulabridge.org and invite people to donate and give and give to the program. While we while we endeavor to ensure that we are covered uh, for the future years, but they're, they're, we're not we're not covered three years out and four years out. So it also it requires financial support in order to make it happen. So if it has touched you in any way, please share. We invite you to share it. With, with other people. Thank you, Russell. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to note uh, our dear former librarian, Lisa Lepore mentioned, she, you know, she left us 
can't believe she did that, but she left us to go to the Braille Institute. So she's a librarian at the Braille Institute. And she mentioned in one of her comments that she'd love to explore uh, a possible connection between Bridge and the Braille Institute. And I think that's an exciting opportunity. Thank you all so much for being here and for sharing this uh, set of stories with us to connect us more to the resources that we have here and help to illuminate some of the great work that our faculty are engaged in, but most importantly, that our students spend their time in. And it seems to inspire all kinds of career moves that have been really helpful for the community and for, for individuals as well as Antioch. So thank you so much for being here today. And we hope you join us uh, next time when I believe the uh, Anti-Racist Task Force will be speaking uh, and having a discussion with us. So we would love your active participation there as we learn about where these efforts are on our campuses and what ideas are, are percolating uh, and moving things forward uh, in the same vein that we have been joined together with these messy conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine and Russell.